Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and uh, pick up with uh, lung cancer. Hopefully none of you ever have to deal with this. Uh, lost my father-in-law to lung cancer. Was a smoker, also had exposure to asbestos throughout his life. He was a pipe fitter. And um, he always swore it wasn't the smoking that got him, that it was the asbestosis, and you know how that is. <laughs> didn't, didn't argue that, try to argue that more than once. Uh, I happened to be holding his hand when he passed, and but one of the last things he said to me was, the asbestosis got me. And I just nodded my head. I, I didn't think that that was an appropriate time to argue that the smoking for all those years was also a contributor. Uh, we know this. I'm not going to soapbox it for you. The thing that's a problem with lung cancer is that people don't feel it. It's not usually painful. And his first symptom, which is the symptom of many people, is he coughed up blood. And he ignored it. He coughed up blood and said that was just a nosebleed. That was a nosebleed that I had. And, you know, I'm not having any pain. So surely there's nothing wrong with me. In the amount of time that it takes to cough up more blood and maybe start getting a little bit hypoxic, the lungs can become very filled and loaded. His CT scan looked like Swiss cheese, I kid you not. There were a few open areas with oxygenation, but the rest of it was whited out with tumor. It just looked like Swiss cheese. And when they showed me that film, nothing more needed to be said. He was full. There was nothing they could do. They couldn't resect it. There was nothing that could be done. And uh, when he passed, he had metastasis to the brain, so it was much like he had a stroke, hypoxia, and so forth. Luckily, he was on hospice and things went very well as far as his comfort and with his family and so forth. So what I want you to take out of this little discussion is it's a silent thing. If somebody's coughing up blood, that's on my list. That's one of the things that you add to Mary's list, right? If they are coughing up blood, they need to get a chest film, they need to go to the doctor and get followed up on. It might be a nosebleed, it might be nothing, but if the blood is coming up from the lungs, it could be lung cancer, and you need to get to that soon. That needs to be looked at earlier rather than later. Some of them are slow growers. Some of them are very uh, vigorous growers. My uh, father-in-law was, within six months, he was gone. It was a really fast grower. Okay, so we still don't have a lot of options um, as far as what we can do for that. Surgery, radiation, and so forth. Uh, when you look at the chest film, again, you'll see the tumor. And as I mentioned before, a lot of these patients with lung cancer come in with pneumonia. And we'll see a whole area whited out, and we'll think it's pneumonia. But when the pneumonia clears, there's still a spot. And that's when we realize there's tumor. So it is possible that a patient could come in with pneumonia, diagnosed with pneumonia, and find out a little bit later that they have lung cancer. A lot of times we find lung cancer incidentally as well. They'll do a chest film for some other reason. Maybe it's a pre-op before plastic surgery or maybe it's a pre-op before uh, uh, you know, a gallbladder removal and they happen to find a spot on the lungs and that becomes another issue for follow-up. So sometimes it's incidentally discovered by accident. All right, chest trauma. We want to start talking about some of the things that can happen to the lungs as a result of trauma or other uh, uh, issues. The picture that you see up there, which is not a very excellent picture, is a picture of a hemothorax. And so we want to add that to our list here. I drew a picture of cancer there for you. And before I draw the uh, hemothorax, I will tell you that as the cancer grows, it starts eating through the bronchioles. And that's what causes the coughing up blood. You understand? Okay. All right, now hemothorax. Let's see if I can put this one in. Still use this section of the board. With a hemothorax, do I have a red? Well, it's not cool, I don't have a red. With a hemothorax, we have blood. It's gonna have to be blue blood. Uh, 
we have blood that's collecting outside the lung between the lung and the chest wall. That's a hemothorax. It means there's blood in the, in the cavity. Now if we have a penetrating chest wound, let's say that they got stabbed and it went through the chest wall and the lungs, we could have a hemonumo. We could have both blood and air, but we'll draw that picture in a few minutes. The other thing is, if the lung has been punctured, the patient will not only have blood on the outside, but they could also have blood that's getting inside that they cough up. It just depends on what's been breached. Are you following? Okay, so chest trauma could be blunt. If it's blunt, it just means that they've had an impact, like a steering wheel to the chest. That's blunt. Or it could be penetrating. That would be like a knife wound, a stab wound. That would be penetrating. Okay, signs and symptoms of chest trauma. The patient usually has difficulty breathing. They have pain, especially with a deep breath, right? Because as they move, those tissues are moving and it causes discomfort. We may see external signs of trauma. The patient can have shortness of breath, spit up blood, rapid thready pulse, low oxygen saturation, lots of issues. The main treatment for a patient with a hemothorax is a chest tube. What are we going to do? We're going to put a tube right in the bottom of that lung. That's the main treatment. That won't show up. I better use the black. Chest tube. When I put that chest tube in, what's going to come out of it? What better come out of it? Blood. If blood doesn't come out of it and you've got a hemothorax, you don't have your tube in the right place and it's not going to make them better. That tube should go in and blood immediately should be coming out of it. And as the blood comes out, what will happen to this lung? It'll re-expand. How will we know? They'll breathe better and you'll hear lung sounds all the way down. If you're listening to this chest with a bunch of blood there, what will you hear? Nothing. You will hear nothing. As the blood is emptied out and the lung re-expands, then you're going to hear breath sounds. Okay? Thoracentesis, the same thing. They put in a little tube. A chest tube is a bigger tube, both with the intention of draining out the blood. Okay, pneumothorax. Pneumothorax means we have air in the pleural space. Probably, Andrew, we want to focus on these diagrams after I get the slides off and maybe give some time on them so that uh, this probably doesn't show really good on the film. Okay. With a pneumothorax, we have air. We have air in the pleural space. This could be because there's like a hole in the lung. And as there's a puncture hole in the lung or the lung pops because you got old underwear, right? Patients with emphysema get pneumothorax all the time. There's a hole that's created in the lung. The air is going to seep out. Now, you're going to see air up here more so probably than you're going to see it down below. Why? Air goes up and fluid goes down. So guess what? When you look at where the patient's chest tube is positioned, you might know what happened to them. If you have high chest tubes, what's the problem? Pneumothorax. If you have low chest tubes, what's the purpose? Drain out blood or fluid. All right? So if I put it the same treatment, let's say I'm going to put in a chest tube, same treatment, what should come out? The air. So I put a chest tube in there, there should be air coming out. What if there's no air coming out? It's not working. Had that happen downtown, one of the big facilities downtown, had a patient with a pneumothorax and a chest tube in. There wasn't any air coming out of it. Guess what happened? All of her tissues around the chest tube started to blow up with air and become poppy to the touch. They call that sub-Q emphysema. 
She started getting hypoxic. Her lung was collapsing more. The two nurses working with me were filing their nails. I said, you need to get a doctor for me on the phone. I cannot leave this patient. They kept filing their nails. I said, I'm not kidding you. Her pneumothorax is expanding. She continued to swell up with air up into her face and guess even her eyelids puffed out with air. Finally they got me the doctor. Finally I got somebody there and we got another chest tube in her. <laughs> Lots of air coming out. I'm lucky she didn't code. I am very lucky she didn't code. If you've got a patient with pneumothorax and you don't have an air leak, you don't see it coming through your system, you got a problem. Unless of course they've closed their air leak and they're doing very well. But when I looked at her, she wasn't doing very well, and I didn't have an air leak. So what am I to assume when I listen, I hear nothing? It's not good. It's not working. I've got an issue. Okay, so let's look at the slide, make sure that we get the words correctly here, that we understand what's going on. A pneumothorax is air in the pleural space, a complete or partial lung collapse. In my patient, if that lung completely collapsed and I continued to build pressure on that side, it will cause a tracheal deviation. And eventually, enough pressure will build up that the other lung will collapse as well. They call that a tension pneumothorax, where we have one pneumothorax. It expands, pressure increases, the trachea deviates and shifts, and the other lung will pop. I think that's what happened to Princess Diana, that she had a pneumothorax which expanded, she got a tension and she died, if I remember the story correctly. Mm -hmm. She was in a traumatic car accident, yes? Mm -hmm. Patient will have shortness of breath? Yes. Chest pain? Yes. Why will they have unequal chest expansion? One side's collapsed. All right. Chest tube should have an air leak or the pneumothorax is not being resolved. Did I write pneumothorax over there? Well, I will in a minute. Okay, so here's a nicer picture. It shows you the lung collapsed. Here's a little blurry picture of a chest tube. All right, air in the pleural space could happen because of a puncture, a traumatic injury, or a bleb. Do you know what a bleb is? A bleb is a bump that sticks out from the lung. Remember how we talked about a diverticuli that sticks out from the bowels and it becomes weakened and it can rupture easy? Well, a bleb is sort of like that. It's like a bump that sticks out and it can pop easily. We see a fair number of young men that come in with pneumothorax from blebs. It's not only our emphysemics who have weak lungs. There are a fair amount of young people that come in with this. It's usually young men, 20, 24 years old, that come in and have a pneumothorax. And they don't exactly know why, some sort of a bleb or something. Okay, pleural effusion. In pleural effusion, you have fluid. It's not blood, it's fluid in the pleural space outside the lung. So, how would we treat that? Chest tube or thoracentesis. A lot of times this will happen because the patient has cancer. They'll have a tumor up here and that tumor will cause weeping or inflammation. That fluid will sink down into the thoracic cavity and fill up. Or the patient has congestive heart failure. That's another reason for pleural effusion. If we, this also creates atelectasis, right? It does create atelectasis. Patient will not have good breath sounds there. They'll be very decreased. When we put the chest tube in and drain out the fluid, then they're going to have better breath sounds. So in a patient with pleural effusion, we seek to find the cause. Hopefully we can find the cause and stop the weeping. Okay, sometimes we can't. And we have to do a procedure called a pleurodesis. When they do a pleurodesis, 
they empty out the pleural effusion and they puff chalk or tetracycline into the pleural space. And that causes an inflammation or scarring over the surface of the lung. And as that scarring occurs, it shuts down the weeping. It's very painful for the patients. So if they're doing a pleural desis, they shoot that stuff up through the chest tube. Chalk or tetracycline. It's very painful. Make sure your patient gets good pain medicine. It scars it. It causes inflammation and scarring so that it makes like a hardened covering over the outside of the lungs to stop the weeping. They stop weeping. That's it. Sometimes it doesn't work. Depends on the patho. But I want you to see that word in case you see that clinically. All right, pulmonary embolism. What is a pulmonary embolism? That is a ventilation perfusion mismatch. What part is broken? Blood flow. A pulmonary embolism, it could be a thromboembolism, or it could be something else which creates an embolism and interrupts blood flow. So we have good ventilation, but we have impaired perfusion. Okay? The patient will have chest pain and shortness of breath. They look like they're having an MI. But guess what? When you do cardiac enzymes and you do an EKG, they're normal. We usually find pulmonary embolism after we rule out everything else. The other thing you see is <coughs> profound hypoxia. The patient is hypoxic no matter what. No matter what we do, their oxygen level drops. Okay? Pulmonary embolism. I'm not going to draw a picture of that one per se. PE treatment, oxygen. We might use thrombolytics. Okay, this is a picture of a scan. Do you see where the perfusion is not present? You see that very clearly? Yeah, that white spot up there. See, this is ventilation and perfusion matching, and there's a dead area. No perfusion. Okay, this is usually a problem that we try to prevent. What are the things that we do to prevent PE? Heparin, what else? The leg, the leg thingies. All of the stockings, the pneumatics, ambulation, post-op, Lovenox, TEDS. This is a problem we should be preventing. These are the people that advertise on TV. If you or someone you love has ended up with a pulmonary embolism post-op, call 1-800-LAWYER. We will sue for you. <laughs> If the patient has recurrent issues of uh, PE from deep vein thrombosis, they can put in an umbrella, an inferior vena cava filter, green filled filter. Then if they have clots that are traveling up, they'll get trapped in that filter and eventually lysed by the immune system. Okay, the, th the fibrinolytic system in a couple, two, three days. Right? Pulmonary edema. I think that'll be my last picture. When you have pulmonary edema, where is the fluid? Yes, it's inside the lungs. What kind of patients get pulmonary edema? What's equal to, that's right. Or what kind of heart failure? Left-sided heart failure equals pulmonary edema. So the patient with wet lungs, you look at the picture and it's white. That's the fluid inside the lungs. Will a chest tube treat this? No. Chest tube's not going to do a darn thing to help this. It's just going to hurt the patient to have it put in. Are you going to draw the pulmonary embolism tube? Oh, I guess I could, but uh, people usually get that, but I, I can do that. Pulmonary edema. How do we treat pulmonary edema? We give diuretics. We give Lasix. Okay, let's see if I can do a... I don't know. You gotta draw that on a, a lower level than just looking at the lungs, sort of. I don't know if I can draw that, PE. It's an issue with blood flow. 
I guess you could draw a blood vessel coming in with a clot. On the previous picture, there's kind of a dark just dot. Is that what it is? You know, it's like in the alveolus, you've got, the air is okay. Perfusion impaired. Maybe that way. You can look at it that way. The blue blood's coming in all right, but then it stops. I don't know if that does it or not. All right, so let's uh, finish through here. So when a patient has pulmonary edema, they have a buildup of fluid inside their lungs. And our way of getting rid of that is by giving diuretics. Or we can put them on a breathing machine and we can push in on their lungs. We can provide positive end expiratory pressure, PEEP, or CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, or BiPAP. Any of those types of mechanisms press in on the lungs and help push the fluids across those single cell membranes back into the blood, into the vasculature system. Okay, core pulmonale, this is a disease process of the lungs that causes the heart to enlarge. If you have a patient that has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or pulmonary fibrosis, it becomes difficult for the heart, the right side of the heart, to pump the blood through the lungs, yes? In order to do that job, the right side of the heart will enlarge and get big. So we call that core pulmonale. Core meaning heart, pulmonale, caused by the lungs. So right-sided heart enlargement and then failure because of COPD. We see this pretty commonly. Guess what the treatments are associated with? They look just like the treatments that we use for CHF, right-sided heart failure. There's a picture of a big old heart. It should only be about half that size. Sometimes you'll see a heart that goes almost from one side of the chest all the way to the other. Chest way too big, way, way, way too big. All right, now we'll just cover the COPD diseases, diseases really quickly and then I'll, uh, so I'm gonna run over just a little bit if that's okay with you and I'll let you out earlier on the other class. Asthma is reactive airway disease. This is considered reversible and in some books will not fall, fall under the category of COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease because it can be considered reversible. What happens in asthma? The bronchioles do what? They constrict. The main assessment that you hear is wheezing. It is always good when you're asthmatic is wheezing. Why? Because they're moving air. If your asthmatic stops wheezing, you're not moving air, it's very dangerous. That's the rule of thumb that we use in the clinical setting. Asthmatics wheezing is good. When they stop wheezing, get into the room and make sure they're okay. I mean, they could be better, but the downside is they could be worse. The inflammation over time, okay, will cause some weeping and obstruction of airflow coming out. All right, so narrowing. The other word is that hyper-responsive or reactive airway. We talked about multiple triggers. There is an association of asthma with GERD. And I don't know if that has to do with reflux and reflux aspiration. Not really sure about that. There's also a combination of things that go together. Nasal polyps, asthma, and sensitivity of, of aspirin. Guess what? I was an asthmatic as a child. I'm allergic to aspirin. I don't know if I got polyps or not, but uh, apparently this is something that they're seeing as a correlation of factors. All right, asthma management. We'll be going over all of these drugs in pharmacology. The whole idea is bronchodilation and decrease inflammation. It's not the scope of this class for me to go through all of this list, but you may do that if you would like. COPD, we want to be sure that we talk about the two that are always listed under COPD, which is chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Tobacco is still considered one of the major issues. Uh, there is a hereditary link. We know that the lungs get weaker with aging and infection can stimulate or uh, cause the process to in increase. 
All right, COPD, bronchitis, and emphysema are most often irreversible, okay? With emphysema, the lungs get big and stretched out. The analogy is old underwear. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Would you rather paint this whole room with all of its walls or would you rather that I put a bunch of dividers into this room and then made you paint all of those walls plus all the dividers? What's the difference between one big room and a room that's separated? Surface area. Surface area. That's what happens in a patient who has emphysema. They lose surface area. Instead of having 25 small rooms in which you need to paint all the walls where gas exchange can occur, they have one big room. And all of that space in the center is called dead. No gas exchange is occurring. So emphysemics have a lot of dead space. You're not going to hear a lot of gas exchange. I mean, you're going to hear a lot of air movement. You wouldn't hear gas exchange anyway, but you're not. Bronchitis patients overproduce mucus and phlegm. And that becomes an obstructive issue for them. All right, here's a nice picture of your emphysemic patient. They are the ones that develop the barrel chest. They call them the pink puffers. Okay. And uh, elastin, elastin and collagen fibers are destroyed. Yes, old underwear. Air enters easily but is trapped inside. Dead space. Formation of bulla and blebs, which can lead to rupture. You see those bumpy areas on the outside of the lungs? <coughs> they can easily rupture. So your patient with emphysema can end up with a pneumothorax easily. We talked about chronic bronchitis. They make too much mucus and phlegm. Uh, hyperplasia of those glands. Disappearance of the cilia is a problem. Overall with COPD, these are the, some of the diagnostic things they do. Pulmonary function tests, PFTs. How much air are they moving? Forced expiratory volume. They use a device and they'll say breathe out as hard as you can. FEV1, forced expiratory volume in one second. <sighs> if a patient is really obstructed and their COPD is very severe, guess what? They don't move any air out. You follow? So their forced expiratory volume in one second is very low. Patients that are managed in the home can measure their own and they have prescriptive things to do. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of the rest of this. You can read on this yourself. Uh, we'll talk about COPD more in the other classes. Um, our main focus is to talk about the patho more so than the diagnosis, treatment, and so forth.